Good afternoon. Thank you all so much for coming to our session. My name is Hillary Hunt. I'm the Director of Land Protection at the Southwest Michigan Land Conservancy, and I use she, her pronouns. My co-presenter's name is Mitch Leto, who is the Stewardship Director at Southwest Michigan Land Conservancy. Mitch uses he, him pronouns. We are very excited to present to you today on one of our favorite topics, which is climate-driven strategies in land protection and stewardship, otherwise known as from planning to planting. So the project which we are presenting today is the culmination of several years of work on a strategic land conservation plan, which is actually framed on the concept of climate resilience. So our plan could serve as a roadmap for your own resilience planning, or you could wrap it into a strategic plan like we did. Here's a quick roadmap of where we are headed in our presentation today. The presentation will take roughly an hour and will be followed by 30 minutes of live Q&A. So we work in the nine counties of Southwest Michigan to preserve wild and scenic places for today and keep them healthy for tomorrow. This photo is representative of one of the most stunning natural features in our service area, the large freshwater sand dunes along the eastern coast of Lake Michigan. Over the last 30 years, this 2021 is actually our 30th anniversary, um, we have protected around 18,000 acres, the majority of which is through conservation easements. Although we also own and operate about 50 nature preserves, about 18 of which are open to the public. As I mentioned earlier, our service area encompasses nine counties in Southwest Michigan, which for you East Coasters is an area about the size of Connecticut. Um, our work occurs on the ancestral, present, and future homelands of the Potawatomi. And as you can see, our region's climate and ecology is very much dominated by the presence of Lake Michigan over here on our west side, as well as several large river corridors, which all drain into Lake Michigan. On this map, you can see in orange, we have our conservation easements, and in green, we have our nature preserves, which are our fee-owned lands owned by the Conservancy. And here, for folks who are not as familiar with the Midwest or flyover country, um, here is a brief orientation to where we are. Um, we have Chicago over here on the west and Detroit over here on the east. We are exactly halfway between those two. All right. Thanks, Hillary. Um, and I thought that before we get into kind of the meat of our climate resiliency planning and talk specifics, just kind of back up and let folks know how we got to this point in the first place. And so the way we got here is by trying to answer this age old question, which I have in quotations there, which has only been around really as long as There we go. Only has been around as long as land trusts and conservation groups um, have been asking, what land do we protect? Essentially, what kind of land and where in the landscape? Um, this is our 3 million acre service area, like Hillary mentioned. You can see the lighter textured areas correspond to a lot of agriculture, possibly pasture land. The light gray and white areas are our urban centers. The ribbons of green follow waterways. The large blocks of green are um, big public uh, areas, often forests or intact landscapes, and of course, uh, Lake Michigan on the, the west side there. So there's over six watersheds. There's just a lot to, to take in. Um, for a small organization, it's hard to know where to work. So we could be protecting wetlands along waterways that we know provide really critical ecological functions. They protect really important recreational health, you know, water quality aspects of the landscape and form these natural corridors. But arguably, they are less prone to development than uh, corresponding upland areas. So we have that kind of push pull. Another push pull that we have is the trying to figure out what land to protect and where to work is the urban to rural spectrum. So most of the folks that live in our service areas are found in these higher population density um, areas, including ourselves. And um, if we are to serve the most number of people in our service area as possible, then we should be working within these urban areas or adjacent to them. Um, but we know that there's some ecological values like biodiversity, you know, rare species, uh, ecological function that sometimes need larger areas to really 
to really work well um, are gonna start to decline as you get closer to residential development. So we have sort of that push pull. And then another one that uh, we've you know, historically focused on a lot of endangered species conservation, which is certainly a worthy cause and we still continue to focus on um, today. This is our lovely Eastern Massasauga rattlesnake. This is a federally endangered species that uh, in the kind of core of its, its habitat um, in Southern Michigan is uh, in Southwest Michigan in particular. And, um, you know, these uh, species are very vulnerable and need our help, but there is a risk of missing the larger biodiversity crisis by focusing too many resources on a single species, right? So um, another sort of just uh, conflicting, you know, way of looking at things and trying to figure out where to protect land. So sort of continuing with that question of where do we protect land? What land do we protect? One way to do that would be to come up with a strategy, um, sit down and come up with priorities uh, and look at these different areas. So this is a snapshot of our 2007 strategic land conservation plan. Uh, and this really was the guiding document um, for the past you know, 10 to 15 years um, at this point to really hone in on what was most important and what we were capable of doing as a relatively small nonprofit. So you can see on the left there, the number one, the first tier, that corresponds to the sort of level of priority. So things that were really important and we hope to accomplish um, in the near future were in first tier and then we had second, third and fourth. You can see the location is highlighted, lots of information about um, each project. You can see what the primary threats are um, to the area in terms of development or degradation and then see what kind of category it fits into. Is it an endangered species project? Is it a water quality project? Is it a preserve expansion project? Those sorts of things. And you know, I would say as far as the resources we had at the time, this was a really good and wise approach. Um, and really how we came up with the content was to get all of the folks in our organization, including volunteers, uh, board members, and staff together in a room that really have this archival knowledge and personal knowledge of the landscape in Southwest Michigan to come up with these priorities, places we know there's biodiversity, endangered species, et cetera. But of course, using that uh, 2020 uh, hindsight, we can say that it was strategic and focused. And indeed, we did accomplish uh, the majority of the, um, of the priority projects that we laid out. So it was very successful in that way. But of course, it is subjective because uh, it's a result of the minds that are in the room. Everyone has their biases, right? And we don't know what we don't know. Um, so three, three million acres is a lot of area to get familiar with. So having said that, um, in 2020, we thought that it was time to come up with a new roadmap, a new strategic conservation plan. And looking at the 2007 version, and of course things changing with technology and just changing as they are, we wanted to have um, some key attributes. So one uh, very important one was to be objective. Um, so like Hillary mentioned, you know, we really value the Lake Michigan shoreline for migratory corridor, it has a lot of cultural value, um, a lot of special ecosystems, uh, but we wanted to give every county, every area a fair shake. And so we wanted to be objective in that way. And we felt that the best way to do that was to go to the data, uh, publicly available data, primarily through uh, geographic information's GIS platform. And we really wanted to look at the entire service area, um, like I mentioned. We also wanted it to be collaborative um, as it was previously, but in addition to all the Southwest Michigan Land Conservancy folks, we wanted to include partners from other uh, organizations that we work with um, in the community um, around planning and conservation. And then of course the you know, 10,000 pound elephant in the room is climate change and wasn't explicitly uh, acknowledged or incorporated into the 2007 uh, version. Um, and at this point, you know, in 2020 and 2019, starting to plan this, um, you know, climate impacts are no longer, you know, pictures of, of polar bears on icebergs. They're things that we are seeing locally, um, perhaps not as dramatic or maybe not as easy to see. Uh, but we were experiencing a lot of change in hydrology. Um, some, you know, historic infrastructure like this five foot by 30 foot steel culvert. Um, that blew out during a spring rainstorm on one of our preserves 
um, they're no longer sufficient for the rain pulses and the hydrologic cycles that we're seeing um, you know, in 2020 and beyond. We're seeing water being mitigated and pumped from one watershed into another, one lake into another, just things that have really never occurred before in uh, folks' memory of their lifetime. We're also seeing continued analyses of our biodiversity in our area. And this is one done by our partners at the Michigan DNR and it highlights uh, different groups of uh, taxa or of animals on the bottom, uh, birds, insects, fish, amphibians, etc. And the, the bars um, above them correspond to whether a species is vulnerable to climate change or not. And the yellow and orange bars indicate being vulnerable to climate change. So you can see, especially for some of those species like um, amphibians and aquatics, um, aquatic species, they are quite vulnerable to the effects of climate change. And we're also hearing folks say that, you know, many of our northern species, um, like the eastern hemlock, that uh, have a lot of cultural and ecological value in our service area, uh, are going to continue to decline and really be uh, stressed even more due to high summertime temperatures in particular. So we're seeing those things, um, and we really wanted to be intentional um, and start to uh, incorporate climate change into the strategic planning process. So luckily, our friends at the Land Trust Alliance, who we obviously all know because we're all here, have the Land and Climate Grant Program. And this program really provided the, the funding um, for us to do our strategic conservation plan, uh, but also just their own initiative gave us a framework to talk about these things with. So if we're being totally honest here, the Land Conservancy really wasn't super progressive and out front in communicating to our membership and the general public about climate change. Um, there's some concern with sort of our past uh, areas of support and donors and the fact that climate change has been politicized to a certain degree, um, obviously shouldn't be, but it is. And so um, using the, the Land Trust Alliance you know, name and, and platform to work within uh, really gave us a framework to talk about that. So that was a huge boon to uh, us working on this project as well. Awesome, thanks Mitch. So uh, we've talked a lot about resilience in the land trust community in general, and many of you have probably been to LTA webinars about the concept of resilience, particularly in this case, climate resilience. But just really quick, um, resilience is actually the ability of an area of land and its associated communities to survive, persist, and thrive under climate changes. So resilience is one of the most important aspects and attributes of land that's being considered for conservation because we want to protect land that's going to remain high quality, um, even under what we are experiencing with climate change, some of the things that Mitch talked about. So there's lots of factors that actually influence resilience, but for our purposes, we selected three targets, which you can see along the bottom here, water quality, biodiversity, and connectivity as these are three of the primary components of a resilient ecosystem. I will note that the biodiversity target actually included several abiotic factors, such as soil type, topography, land cover, et cetera. Um, so those types of factors were included as well. So for our methods, uh, we knew that the level of GIS analysis that we wanted to do was gonna be beyond what the capability of our staff was. So we contracted with geographers at the Western Michigan University, um, which is here in our, the town where our land trust is located. Um, and we also got lots and lots of feedback from our partners while we were identifying our three targets. So with the help of these partners for each target, we identified several component variables that really compose that target. And I'll show those to you on the next slide. But um, after choosing our component variables, we identified the appropriate data layers to use in the modeling. And that was probably some of the hardest part of this um, because some of these variables required new knowledge for us and new research into different data sources and new data sets that we at our staff had not used before. Um, so after we had chased down all those data sets, we plugged them into the model and we calculated scores for each point on the map. So for those not familiar with GIS, you can imagine the map as like a TV or computer screen. Um, and each point on the map is really like a pixel. So what GIS did is it actually calculated a score for every pixel on that map. Um, however, as all the land protection staff today know, um, 
Land protection projects never happen at a single point, um, and the parcel boundaries can be you know, totally <laughs> separate from the ecosystem boundaries and any natural to topographic boundaries as well. Um, so we had to come up with a larger way of dividing the service area. So we divided our entire service area into quarter mile hexagons. Um, so quarter mile across, quarter mile high, and then we could score each of those hexagons separately. Um, and those are more comparable to parcels and section lines and quarter quarter sections and that sort of thing. So each hexagon on our final map has an overall score across all three targets, which is its resilience score, and then also has an individual score for each target. So I'm going to take you briefly through um, our three targets. So here's the first, water quality. Um, so on the left here, where my uh, cursor is, you can see the name of the target, which is water quality. Um, to the right are its component variable categories, which are the parts that make up the whole of the water quality target. Um, then we describe each uh, component variable under type a little bit more in detail. To the right of that, you can see the category max which actually shows the maximum amount of points in each category. We obviously had to assign points to these attributes to be able to get scores. Um, and then over here is the type max, which um, breaks down each component variable into their individual score. And finally, on the right, you can see the description of how the variable is scored. So some of them are binary here, like present or absent, whereas others are scored from 0 to 100 in a continuous manner um, based on the level of the um, variable. So for water quality, we went through um, the following component variables. So first, um, the percent of the hexagon that is wetland, um, pretty self-explanatory. Um, we also included the physical components of wetland functionality. Um, this data set is one, many land trusts use this, but this is basically um, the types of abiotic functions that the wetland provides. So flood storage, uh, nutrient transformation, et cetera. We also have for surface water, um, the presence or absence of water, it's either there or it's not, as well as the feet of frontage on surface water to kind of show how much surface water there might be there. Um, we also included the uh, presence of forested first order streams. Um, this has nothing to do with the Star Wars first order. Instead, um, first order streams refer to the uppermost branch of their system. Um, so they are the coldest, um, highest water quality in their entire system. Um, groundwater also plays a very important part in water quality, so we were sure to include that. So you can see we have groundwater recharge potential as well as the components of the drastic model, which is basically and very, um, very quickly um, how quickly surface water reaches the groundwater and then how it spreads throughout the area. So drastic combines things like permeability, topography, net recharge, et cetera. Finally, we included forest cover because we knew that water resources and surface water that's proximal to intact forest cover is gonna be much colder and much higher quality. Um, so we wanted to ensure that we were giving preference to those types of water bodies. And then at the bottom, here, 800 is the category max for all, that's the highest score any uh, hexagon could get. So next is biodiversity. Um, uh, many more variables um, than with water quality. So um, here, um, it was really important to us to actually include the real numbers of biodiversity and actual real representation of species richness on the landscape. So these um, top, three core design team, MNFI and MNFI are actually Michigan specific um, biodiversity data sets, but it's very likely that you would have something similar in your state. Um, they were scored differently depending on you know, what kind of data were in them. But um, we also knew that those data sets kind of had a bias towards terrestrial ecosystems. So we explicitly included the presence of cold water streams here. Um, and that has its own scoring section. 
because many of Michigan's most threatened species are actually cold water aquatic species, such as mussels, um, and because they are chronically overlooked in the existing biodiversity data sets, we included cold water streams really as a proxy for the presence and protection of those uh, aquatic species. So here's the abiotic factors I mentioned before. We included the Nature Conservancy's landscape diversity data set, which is an incredible resource. Um, there, all of their resilience work is pretty amazing and um, it was hugely impactful and helpful for us in this analysis. Um, so, you know, there was points for um, climate gradients and microhabitats incorporated in their data set. Um, of course, hexagons also received points for land uses that were not urban or agricultural, um, because obviously those land uses do not contribute to uh, species resilience and, uh, sorry, climate resilience. So we also then modeled the continual natural land cover using the forested land use land cover data set to make sure that we captured the exclusively upland forests. Because remember, we included the wetland forests in the water quality target. In water quality, we also included the abiotic functions of wetlands, but here, in biodiversity, we included the um, habitat categories from the wetland functionality data set. So that would be um, amphibian habitat, shorebird habitat, uh, migratory bird habitat, things like that. Um, and then finally, soil diversity, which here is basically standing in for plant diversity because a wide variety of soils in a, uh, in a, sorry, in a hexagon is naturally um, going to support a wider variety of vegetation. Here's our final target, connectivity. We leaned very heavily on the Nature Conservancy's resilience data, primarily their local connectedness measure up here at the top. Um, so local connectedness measures the degree of fragmentation and the strength of barriers that create resistance to movement across and within a landscape. So a highly connected landscape promotes resilience by allowing species to actually move through the landscape and find suitable microclimates uh, where they can persist. In this study, um, we calculated local connectedness by measuring the amount and configuration of human created barriers like roads, parking lots, um, farms, energy infrastructure, et cetera. And that calculation, which was done by the Nature Conservancy, um, we were able to include in our model um, and just use that same data. We also included a measure of regional flow here, um, which is really more about like the broader flow patterns across the entire region and measures how these patterns become slowed, redirected, or channeled due to the spatial arrangement of impediments. So think more like on a county scale. Um, together, these two data sets measure and, sorry, model the ability of species to move across the landscape. So, um, ta-da, here we go. This is the first map that we saw as part of this project. Um, this is a map, a spatial representation of the biodiversity target. Um, so here, when you're looking at it, the important thing to remember is that dark green is high biodiversity, high species richness. Whereas when you get down to the lighter yellows, that kind of orangey burnt yellow color, um, that's not so good. <laughs> Those are the more um, ag and urban areas. Um, but there's many, many places with really dark green, really rich uh, biodiversity. Most of these were not a huge surprise to us. Um, they tended to cluster around existing large protected land. So we have a very state game area up here. There's an Allegan state game area over here. Um, down in the south here on our border with Indiana, we have several, not as large state game areas, but kind of a cluster of them near each other. Some of the river systems really popped out um, that have large wetland complexes along their banks. And those are places that were much harder to develop. So left much more natural, therefore more resilient. Um, so it's, you can very clearly see the places where um, biodiversity is able to persist in the landscape in this map. So here's the water quality result. 
Um, this one, I think the main takeaway for a national audience is we are so fortunate to have as much um, surface water as we do in Southwest Michigan. Um, it's pretty incredible how important um, abundant water resources are to all of the natural communities in our area. Um, and here you can see again, it just follows those lines of the um, tributaries of these larger river systems, um, as well as the wetland complexes. Um, and so this again was pretty much mapping where the, the surface water is in our area. So connectivity um, is, a, I think, a bit harder to read. Um, I remember like turning my head to the side when you first saw this map. So really, because there's only the two variables, it's just a little bit more binary <laughs> with, the, with the representation that you're looking at. So here, the brighter kind of goldenrod yellow is um, really high connectivity. So very uh, species are very able to move across the landscape, whereas the dark gray is the least uh, connected uh, for the natural lands. So some of the most developed areas in our entire service area are right here um, around the city of Kalamazoo. So these are places where it would be very hard for terrestrial taxa to move across the landscape. And again, these very rural, fairly protected areas like the Berry State Game Area and here down here in the Jones State Game Area, Allegan, are very, very connected because they don't have as many major roads, as many impediments to connectivity. All right, so um, when we combined all three of those together, here's what we got. Um, it's very psychedelic and very fun. Um, but the important thing to remember here is that dark blue and dark green are really great scores. So here you can see those tiny little hexagon shapes actually um, when you zoom in and you can see that some of them are just way uh, you know above and beyond scoring really high in all three areas, which leads to them really popping out in blue here on this final map. Um, I think the important thing to note here is that we did weigh all of our targets equally. So you'll remember that some of those max scores for each target were different, but actually here we made sure they were weighted equally so there wouldn't be any bias towards any one of the um, targets. Um, again, you can see that the rivers and state game areas popping out pretty noticeably, which is expected. Um, but with this map, you can really begin to see some of the connectedness of these high quality areas. So there's these long, thin um, branches of blue and green, and not all of these are necessarily waterways, actually. Some of them are, you know, some uh, ridges that didn't get farmed, they didn't get developed. But you can see that there's <clears throat> real connections between these different high quality blue areas. And that was actually our most important finding. So on to results. Um, the highest scoring hexagons are those that scored highly in all three targets. These are what we're seeing as the most resilient areas in our entire service area. And because protecting land that will stay resilient is our goal, we needed to translate these scores into usable spatial data. So again, we had calculated those highest scoring clusters in the entire model. So we took the top 10%, really the cream off the top, and these areas with a little bit of drawing and tracing um, became our priority areas. So we ended up with seven biodiversity hubs, which are the um, very large clustered areas of natural land that's managed for biodiversity, like a state game area. But because connectivity is a critical piece of our analysis and a critical part of resilience, we also identified eight corridors that connect natural land. So protecting land in these corridors will facilitate the movement between the hubs um, to support the larger population on the landscape, especially as the climate warms. So here is the um, final result, which we call nature's network. Um, this is the last map we made. This is kind of the final piece. Um, you can see that we have our corridors in rainbow colors here. And they are connecting the hot pink hubs. Different distances, different lengths, um, different sized hubs. A lot of them are based around a state game area or existing large protected piece of land. Um, and many of them are actually named after those pieces of protected land. So um, 
There's a big marsh preserve out here, Fort Custer State Recreation Area, Jones State Game Area, Allegan State Game Area, Barry State Game Area. So, but we're, it's pretty exciting to see that we're able to connect those really high quality hexagons with other high quality areas, which is going to, of course, create resilience for the landscape and for um, the natural communities on it. So our protection efforts from here on out are going to focus on shoring up those hubs, so kind of filling in the gaps and then connecting them um, by acquiring land in the corridors. So on the next slide, I'm gonna give you an example of a land protection project that's actually based on our climate resilience plan. And we use the climate resilience plan or nature's network as really the um, reason for proceeding with this plan, or sorry, with this project. So here's what we're zooming into. We're zooming into Fort Custer, northeast corner of Kalamazoo County. So outlined in hot pink is the Fort Custer Biodiversity Hub. It ranked very highly in the model due to this large purple crosshatched um, state recreation area and actually also Army Fort. That's why it called, it's called Fort Custer. Um, there are several endangered species on this purple uh, property, including the Eastern Mathisaga rattlesnake, which Mitch mentioned, as well as um, some plants and uh, insects as well. Um, so fortunately, um, an army base wouldn't necessarily be a place that would get protected and seen as protected land, but the partnership between the State Parks Department and the Department of Defense is very strong, and they are both interested in protecting the critical habitat they own. So the area is very well managed for biodiversity and will remain so. Um, we also own a nature preserve over here in green. This is the Augusta floodplain forest. Um, and you can see we also have some conservation easements up here in this Augusta Creek corridor, which of course our hubs and corridors are connected. Um, we were talking about it for a while as like shoots and ladders. Um, so you can kind of think of it that way. Um, so here's the kind of boundary between Augusta corridor, Augusta Creek corridor and Fort Custer hub. And so when we were um, contacted by a landowner who owned property in this area. Um, we pulled up our model, um, we looked at our maps, and we're very excited to find that his property was a perfect fit, um, kind of putting together the jigsaw puzzle, connecting the hub. Again, this is already all protected with the corridor, which we have a little bit more work to do here. Um, so we're really excited to realize that some of our land protection projects can actually go through this kind of sieve of thinking about how they fit into the net nature's network model. Um, and we can rank them that way and see like what's going to be the best um, choice and what are the best projects to spend time on. So I am going to um, leave it there. There's obviously countless other examples of how nature's network has impacted our land protection priorities, but I'll leave it there for Mitch to take you on a um, stewardship journey. All right, thank you, Hillary. And I think I am your uh, stewardship guide here. So as you can imagine, we're, we're really happy with this um, product, Nature's Network, and this new filter that we're looking at pretty much everything through. Um, but it is primarily a tool for land protection. It could be modified or thought about in some ways for stewardship, um, but primarily a land protection tool. So in terms of stewardship and climate resilience, um, frankly, just in my personal experience, talking with um, colleagues at conferences and coworkers and things like that. We're always acknowledging climate change and you know, acknowledging certainly that it's happening uh, and it's important to be thinking about, but not necessarily coming up with any concrete ways that we should be doing our work differently. It's sort of like, well, if conservation is important now, it's really important under climate change or if habitat restoration is important now, it's even more important under a climate change scenario. And so, for a long time, I hadn't really seen or could grapple with anything that we should be doing uh, in a very different way other than just doing more of it. And so it was in this resiliency project and exploring ideas and talking to partners um, that this Wildlife Conservation Society grant uh, that's funded ultimately by the Doris Duke Charitable Foundation, we came across that specifically was funding ideas around climate adaptation. Uh, and so I think that the fact that this funding source existed uh, did spur us to think differently and really kind of start to put some of those ideas um, to the test. 
And my um, predecessor, Nate Fuller, and I were um, talking about this concept of the ecological tension zone. And if you're a naturalist in Michigan, this is something that you know most of us learn about. And if you travel in Michigan or if you're from Michigan, it's something that you might see as you go to the northern part of the state, maybe not necessarily acknowledge that it's a tension zone, but you notice that things change. And essentially, it's a line across the middle of the state that is a dividing line between northern communities and southern communities. And really, it's a relic of a division that the past era of climate change left us, essentially. So you can see the map on the lower right, um, those tan polygons in the map of Michigan. Those are savannas and prairies, things that are associated with um, regions more to the south uh, and to the west, where they're much more extensive. Um, but just reach up into Michigan there in the Prairie Peninsula. The yellow is, is deciduous forest. And then as you're getting into those different green colors, you're getting into mixed, so deciduous and coniferous or strictly um, coniferous forest in the northern parts of the state. So you can see there's a really distinct line uh, kind of drawn at an angle almost right through the middle of the lower uh, peninsula. And so that is essentially the tension zone. And um, so we wanted to explore this idea of a tension zone and which species may be above and below it. And if that would be uh, changing with the current climate change and future climate change, uh, we also wanted to incorporate the Lake Michigan shoreline into this concept specifically um, because we should be doing climate adaptation everywhere in our service area, but specifically um, if you have spent any time in Michigan or in the Great Lakes region, um, you know that even in the summertime, it can often be really cool, breezy, got that cold air coming off of the big Great Lakes that hold that cold temperature uh, and essentially buffers warm summertime temperatures. And on the flip side, uh, for a long time in the cold season, when the air temperature starts to flip and go cold, the water temperature is warmer and so actually makes uh, lakeshore areas a little more mild and warmer than inland areas um, in the colder months of the year. And so we thought in this way, it might kind of soften uh, some of the changes that climate change might bring about to our um, habitats and species. And so to kind of illustrate this uh, tension zone um, idea a little further, thinking about forested communities, um, which was kind of our focal uh, idea for this project, we have our Eastern Hemlock, which is, um, if you go into the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, in many forests, it's the most common or one of the most common species. And it really starts to trickle off in abundance as you go down to the southern part of the state going to the Indiana, Ohio state line there. And in our corner of the state, it really pretty much follows the lakeshore or follows cool river drainages. Um, that county level map doesn't quite do it justice, but not nearly as abundant as it is in the northern part of the state. And I mentioned too that these northern species are kind of um, undergoing these increased heat stresses. So an even better illustration of that is uh, jack pine, a species that's common in, in open sandy areas, um, but also very cold areas, uh, predominantly in the northern part of the state. And again, you can see that distribution follows that um, eastern shore of Lake Michigan there, uh, following those cooler temperatures that mimic more of its preferred northern climate. And then on the flip side, so thinking about those species kind of representing those northern communities that are following the retreat of the glaciers. And then thinking about southern communities, um, also called Carolinian forests, coming from the south in advancing as conditions got warmer um, historically. One of everybody's favorite plants and trees here in southwest Michigan is the pawpaw, um, much more common in Kentucky and Indiana. Um, you can see that large fruit there. It's also called the Indiana banana. Uh, it's the largest uh, native fruit uh, to North America, and so um, provides a really nice treat in September um, and early October, but it is really a southern species, so um, it is a bit of a novelty when we see it in southwest Michigan. It's kind of exciting. Um, tend to see it in riparian habitats, and then you can see uh, its distribution kind of hitting the northern um, area in the country of its distribution goes right along the ecological tension zone. Uh, Kentucky coffee tree, similarly, um, and you can probably guess by its name, is predominantly a southern species, grows along rivers. Um, and so you see not only the 
the southern distribution, but also the distribution along our large rivers um, in southwest Michigan, the Grand and the Kalamazoo there. So this is a species that um, begins to thin out even more um, due to uh, it's kind of hitting its extent of its northern distribution. And then, so we have this sort of gradient of, of southern species that either are um, in terms of abundance in Michigan and going down even further, species like the river birch, which are more common uh, in areas south of Michigan, just get into the southwest corner of Michigan, which is you know, the warmest part of the state um, as a whole. And so you can see, depending on which species you look at, um, their range uh, within that tension zone is a little bit different according to their sensitivity. Uh, but the concept it's, uh, itself um, is, is obvious there. And we know from, from the literature and from pollen core data from lakes that this tension zone between northern and southern communities has shifted as much as 100 miles historically uh, during levels of climate change that are equivalent to what we're predicted to experience or even less than what we're predicted to experience. So those species, you know, essentially moved 100 miles and we know with our roads and our current fragmented landscape, that's probably not possible anymore for them to do on their own. And so really uh, embracing this um, idea, we uh, made a proposal to the Climate Adaptation Fund. And I am happy to say that uh, last year we were funded uh, by the Wildlife Conservation Society. So uh, $375,000 um, toward the general idea of forest health and climate resiliency within those forest uh, ecosystems. And so this was a big um, partnership. We really wanted to look at a regional scale because that's where climate is occurring on and that's historically where these migrations occurred along. So you can see that map on the right. Um, the lines across the middle are actually um, degrees of latitude as they increase and decrease from north to south. And you can see the little polygons on there um, correspond to the different project areas, the different natural areas. and You'll also notice that they are um, within 10 miles of the lakeshore, again, trying to embrace the lakeshore climate um, to give ourselves a better shot um, at the, these northern species surviving and these climate adaptation projects working. We also worked with five other organizations um, in these efforts, uh, including the Nature Conservancy, uh, Shirley Hines Land Trust, um, Chickaming Open Lands uh, Trust, uh, as well as private landowners and uh, municipal park system, Ottawa County. And you can also see on that map, the different sort of shapes of the polygons um, correspond to different types of climate adaptation strategies. So this idea comes from the literature um, and has really been uh, promoted a lot in the Forest Service and some of these climate adaptation um, workshops and courses. Uh, the first strategy is called resistance. So like it sounds, uh, you're kind of resisting the change. You're trying to maintain things the way they were or the way they are, uh, sort of status quo. And in this case, uh, our climate resistance project was taking place in this native beech maple hemlock forest, uh, where these hemlock trees are um, experiencing uh, stressors from climate, but also are um, encountering additional stresses from an invasive forest pest called the hemlock woolly adelgid, which if you're from the East Coast or the Appalachian Mountains, you'll know that this has the potential to absolutely wipe out stands of hemlock trees. Uh, and because they have such a cultural and ecological value in our region, we really wanted to protect them. So um, a resistance strategy made sense in this case. Now resilience, which of course is a word that we're hearing um, a lot at this conference and heard a lot in this presentation uh, is sort of embracing that same idea. Um, so it's a flexibility, it's a variability uh, ecologically and um, in terms of species richness that allows a system to bounce back after a disturbance or after um, some kind of hydrological event, temperature event, um, you know, invasive species comes through, something like that, allows a system to, to bounce back. In, in our particular case, that came in the form of trying to add a greater species diversity and forest complexity to some of our degraded beech maple and hardwood swamps. Um, so our hardwood swamps in particular used to be dominated um, by black ash and green ash in some cases and even white ash and pretty much all of those mature ash trees have been killed off by the emerald ash borer, uh, another invasive forest pest that many of you are probably familiar with. 
And so the idea there being that if we could sort of clean up um, the invasive species, stabilize the area, and then incorporate greater uh, diversity into the system, we might build in the, the flexibility um, to withstand uh, such a future change should it happen again. And then at sort of the most uh, extreme end of the climate adaptation strategies is this idea of transition. Um, and much like it sounds, you're helping a natural area transition into some future state that we think is going to be more uh, sustainable under climate change scenarios. So for us, um, this was uh, an area that had been very disturbed, it had been clear cut, then it had been um, farmed, turned into an orchard, and the orchard had been removed and destroyed, and then um, essentially turned into an old field, and uh, non-native coniferous trees were planted. And so it was very, very different from its original, um, its original state. And so it felt like a great uh, sort of platform and trial ground to bring some of these um, novel species together, forming a new uh, forest community that would be more adaptable uh, with climate change. And in particular, because the sort of default uh, native uh, beech maple forest um, is predicted to be quite vulnerable to climate change. So we wanted to be thinking ahead with that. All right, and so uh, I wanna highlight and, and definitely shout out the, uh, the US Forest Service uh, Climate Change Tree Atlas, which was a huge source of data and kind of inspiration for our um, planting lists and species choices. And so you can see some images here. Many of you have probably used this tool. Um, it's really great. It essentially has uses the FIA or forest inventory analysis that's been conducted um, on kind of a decadal scale for a very long time. It gives us lots of information about tree species, their distribution, and um, able to correlate that with natural features in the landscape, be the waterways, elevation, climate, soils, those sorts of things. Uh, and then we can predict when things like climate and temperature change, we know which species track with which variables and that allows the um, tool essentially to predict what areas um, of the country, the east in this case, will be suitable for a particular species of tree. Um, and so I think that's a really important uh, point to, uh, to make is that it's not showing where these species will migrate to, but it shows the areas in the landscape that will be amenable to their growth or that would likely support their growth. And I think that's important because it really kind of justifies um, the concept behind our project, which is making intentional plant choices when we're doing reforestation um, and habitat restoration projects because with our highways and fragmented landscapes, um, we know that those tree species cannot move the same way they could um, in the past. We also knew that current climate change is advancing faster than it has in past climate change eras. So those two things really stack against trees being able to move. And so um, therein uh, lies our strategy. And so, um, so our strategy is to both use Southern tree species. So species like a white oak, which is fairly common um, in Michigan, but also has a very southerly distribution is common um, shown here on the map throughout the South and the Southeast and other parts of the Midwest, but also trying to source where we can genotypes from Southern sources. So not going terribly far South, but maybe a hundred miles, a couple degrees of latitude, uh, Central Ohio, Indiana, or Illinois, um, if possible, knowing that the genetic material of those um, individual trees might be more useful in dealing with high summertime temps um, in particular, because our climate essentially will parallel um, the climates of those areas um, in the coming years. So just to highlight a few species that we are um, trying to use and that kind of exemplify that idea. Uh, so sycamore is a very beautiful tree um, used in landscaping and, and street trees and has this kind of peely uh, pale bark, grows along waterways um, and has a, has a very Southern uh, distribution. So that is a great species. The black gum, is a species that is found in Southern Michigan. It's not terribly common, uh, but it's predicted by the US Forest Service uh, sort of modeling to be very adaptable under a climate change scenario. And you do see it in quite a wide variety of habitats, has great wildlife value, also just a really cool tree. 
And then blue ash, I mentioned that our um, white, uh, green, and black ash species have all been killed by emerald ash borer. Uh, but this blue ash, which is a little more distantly related, uh, is just different enough that it is um, fairly resistant to emerald ash borer and also happens to have a southern distribution. Um, so would be a good candidate for, uh, for forest resiliency projects like we're talking about here. And then the last one I'll highlight is the tulip tree, uh, which is something that is uh, fairly common here in southern Michigan, but is super adaptable, is found throughout the south, um, is, is predicted to be uh, sustainable in climate change um, scenarios, grows in a variety of forest types, a uh, very fast growing tree, provides a lot of great um, structure and function in the ecosystem. Um, and so I'll give you a sense of where we are currently. We're in the middle of the grant at this point. Uh, and being that it is a forestry grant and we're building new forests and we're sort of enhancing and um, giving the existing forest some, some leverage against climate change, It'll be a long time before we really know how successful um, they are, but um, you know, hopefully with a couple of uh, late frosts and winters and growing seasons, we'll be able to tell uh, initially um, if it's a, a successful in terms of using some of these southern species further north than they normally are. So our first strategy that I mentioned was resistance, um, and we essentially used um, stem injection treatments in eastern hemlocks. And we uh, monitored, counted, measured uh, around a thousand of these trees at a couple of our preserves and some private lands nearby and successfully um, treated all a thousand. So prophylactically and also um, after being invaded uh, and fed on by the hemlock woolly adelgid. So we we're hundred percent treated there and we're uh, monitoring the response um, at this point, still too early to tell. And then in terms of our resilience, so that concept of building flexibility into degraded forests. Um, the, the image in the center right is, uh, is what I'm calling, in this case, the degraded forest. Um, it is a very pretty picture to, to look at. There's a lot of green, um, and it's a beautiful forest. And actually, all those trees are native. But this is an area which was reclaimed, essentially, by nature by these trees after being cleared um, and farmed. And so you can see that while there is lots of greenery and lots of trees, uh, there's a lack of structure. There's not a lot of uh, shrub or mid-story layers. You don't see a lot of lower branches on those trees because they're very close together and they all probably germinated around the same time. Um, and, they're, and I can tell you that those uh, are, are one of two species. And so there's not a ton of species richness there either. So should invasive pests come in to affect that tree species, that could wipe out that entire forest. So, the idea here being that we would thin those forests out, create canopy gaps, and plant southern species or southern um, genotypes in those canopy gaps. Uh, we're about 30% into that process, about 1,700 trees down, uh, no small feat. And then uh, our big transition project, we're reforesting essentially 10 acres on one of our nature preserves with some of these uh, northern, uh, sorry, novel assemblages of species, predominantly southern. Uh, we planted about 1,800 species this spring, and we're about 75% uh, planted there. And so you can see the image in the lower right is that reforestation project. Uh, you can see a swim like staff member here um, planting a bare root tree uh, with what's called a dibble or a planting bar there. And then you can see that sort of sea of white sticks in the background are protective tubes. Um, so this area has very, very high deer densities. So in addition to all the climate change and weather variables, we have um, those as well. So protecting those tender little buds and uh, small shrubs and trees is really a, a must in this case. So, so we're really excited to be working on this. Um, it's really kind of pushed us to grow as an organization um, in terms of stewardship and in other ways. Uh, and it's been really a, a fun thought exercise, and uh, I think will provide value um, for our organization, you know, as a whole. So, so that's kind of a, a snapshot of the, the stewardship project that um, I would say is our first one to explicitly be a climate adaptation um, strategy. And then I'll kind of um, circle back as we're transitioning out of our talk here today, back to the, the Nature's Network, that um, 
series of biodiversity hubs and conservation um, corridors, as we're calling them, that Hillary showed earlier. Uh, so you'll kind of recall this map here, seeing them distributed throughout Southwest Michigan. And while we haven't necessarily done the on the ground work, uh, nor could we to measure all of these areas to see whether they really did hold up to the, to the sort of a modeling um, and analysis, it is really, really nice uh, to, to be validated in some cases and to see anecdotally that the biodiversity and the ecological function are really strong in these areas. And so one project in particular that we're very excited about is a new um, publicly accessible nature preserve that will hopefully be uh, open the next spring of 2022. And it is on the very edge of the Allegan Biodiversity Hub uh, there shown in the upper left of the Nature's Network map. And uh, the property is outlined here. So here's some kind of attributes to give you a sense of what's going on um, on the property as a whole. So it's called Armantrout Milbacher Nature Preserve. Um, really rolls off the tongue, so there you go. It's 140 acres, and uh, you can see the dark line uh, kind of snaking around the, the landforms there. That is the Kalamazoo River. So it's the, um, one of the larger watersheds in our service area. And um, so in doing so and bending around and forming those oxbows um, and uh, you know, bends and things like that, give us about three miles of river frontage. And so of course that creates a floodplain and wetland riparian habitats um, along the land's edge and creates really diverse terrain that kind of harkens back to um, Hillary's mention of all these different physical attributes in terms of soil, wetlands, uplands that are important for supporting biodiversity, um, at least as a concept. Uh, and then I also mentioned that it is right next to the Allegan Biodiversity Hub. So even though it's not in the hub, we kind of hope that just by proximity, um, some of those values of biodiversity might be leveraged. And so we're currently undergoing uh, an ecological inventory um, specifically for the botanical resources on the property. And pretty excited to say that the numbers seem to be uh, supporting uh, that, that idea that this era would have um, some resilient features and some, some great biodiversity. So 520 plant species so far. So we're not done with the inventory. But um, that number might not mean anything um, to you specifically, but for an area that's 140 acres in this part of uh, Michigan, it's a pretty impressive uh, number of species to all be coexisting in one environment and really probably owes to the fact that it does have this diverse terrain, um, soil type and hydrology altogether. Also the um, 12 of the species that, are, uh, that have been found there are listed in the state of Michigan either to be a special concern, um, threatened or endangered uh, species. So often endangered species and listed species indicate an intact uh, system. And so that is really encouraging to see those as well as just for those species conservation. Uh, four different listed um, animal species um, in the state of Michigan that we found while um, kind of exploring and doing inventories of the property. And this area in the state is where our oak hickory forests, which occur on drier soils and landscapes, start to transition to oak pine forests. And uh, this is sort of the southern extent of those oak pine forests. And um, as such kind of has a really nice blend of northern and southern species. And so without doing any intentional planting like the other projects um, I described, this has sort of a built in blend of those northern and southern species that kind of exemplify that tension zone that we talked about earlier. Um, so we hope that it has some climate resilience sort of baked in for that reason. Uh, and of course, with a bunch of nature folks um, watching the presentation, I cannot uh, advance the slide without showing you some of those cool species. So this is called um, large flowered leaf cup. It's a threatened uh, plant species in Michigan with a pretty bright yellow flower. This is Eastern Wahoo. Uh, related to burning bush, which is an ornamental shrub used uh, widely in this area. This is the native version that deer really, really like, uh, and so we don't often see. Uh, also is at the northern extent of its range. And then getting into some cute fuzzy critters, uh, prothonotary warblers have been found on this property. They are a special concern um, in Michigan, and uh, apart from being just 
beautiful. They uh, also nest in cavities. They're the only uh, warbler species that nests in cavities in the eastern US. So they're going to be using dead trees in uh, floodplain areas and riparian areas along the river here uh, on the property. And then uh, another highlighting another very interesting and cool species we found out there. Um, Hillary actually documented this one. This is the black rat snake. Uh, and if uh, any folks in the room are from the, the southeast or um, south of Michigan, this might uh, strike you as a surprise that this is rare in Michigan, but it is at the northern end of its range here. And it is a special concern species. Um, they tend to be found along waterways in this area. And they also really cool, they climb trees, which never ceases to amaze me, no legs, climbing trees, and they feed on birds. So um, prothonotary warbler looking a little nervous over there. But anyways, very, very cool indicators of a healthy system with a lot of potential. And so one more um, anecdote that I'll leave you with here before, um, before we part. And that is uh, looking back at the nature's uh, network map again, but this time looking at a corridor. So this is the Black River Headwaters Corridor. It connects the pawpaw biodiversity hub to the algin biodiversity hub, uh, at least in concept. And you can see here it's outlined in blue. Uh, it's about 15 miles long. Uh, it's 27,000 acres, has extensive wetland habitats. So that is the very east edge of the Black River watershed. And uh, the Black River watershed flows from there west uh, into Lake Michigan. And so um, at the edge of the watershed, you often have these spring fed uh, extensive wetland features. And that is the case here. So probably prevented development. There happens to be pretty low development pressure here. There's not a lot of major highways. So there's a lot of opportunity to protect some large tracts of intact land. Um, one of the challenges is that there's very little protected land uh, in this wildlife corridor, so we would have a long way to go. Uh, but happily, two um, Southwest Michigan Land Conservancy Nature Preserves actually exist in this hub. And so as a way to kind of communicate uh, and highlight the value of these conservation corridors, um, we got a, a donation of about $2,000, which allowed us to get eight trail cam setups, because uh, we know, you know, ecologically, spores and seeds and genetics, all sorts of things are flowing through these corridors, but what people probably mostly care about and can connect with are charismatic uh, animals that are also using these corridors. And so we set up um, eight cameras in various corridors in our service area and hoping to capture some of these charismatic species. And I'd like to share a short video, a little less than a minute here, of what I think is one of the more um, exciting findings. So of course that is the North American river otter, also my all time favorite animal species. So uh, this was really exciting. Uh, not something that many of us had seen in our um, service area before. Um, you can see most of the uh, images are uh, at nighttime. So they're kind of nocturnal and shy um, in our area, but would be corresponding to a lot of those wetland features um, and just kind of an exciting way to be able to communicate um, some cute animals that also probably rely on these wildlife corridors. So uh, with that, I will end here and thank everyone for joining us um, today. Our website is uh, swmlc.org. You can find us on social media. I have a YouTube channel. This is our contact information here below. Uh, and of course, need to take a moment and thank uh, LTA for uh, funding our resiliency analysis uh, Wildlife Conservation Society and Doris Duke for funding our stewardship project, U.S. Forest Service and NIACS, the Northern Institute of Applied Climate Sciences 
for assistance in use of those um, tree climate atlas tools. So with that, um, thank you everybody. And uh, we'll have some time for questions now.